What are the forces moving history? That's the question for this episode of Theories of History. Hi there, I'm Jostein and I make videos about theories of history and historical literature. If you're as nerdy as me or simply like my videos, feel free to press that subscribe button and the bell so we can see each other again soon. In this video I'll be discussing the famous Russian author Leo Tolstoy's great historical novel about the Napoleonic Wars, War and Peace. I put a link to the book and some recommended reading in the description below. The book was published in 1869, and in the second epilogue of the book, Tolstoy explains his philosophy of history, which I'll be discussing shortly. In other words, he actually gives us the clue to understanding the novel, for War and Peace is in many respects a philosophical work presented as literature. You'll see what I mean. Tolstoy was a Russian count, and lived most of his life at his estate Yasnaya Polyana, south of Moscow. He wrote and published both fictional and philosophical literature throughout his life. Like so many great authors, he struggled with a number of issues, his aristocratic heritage, religious belief, pacifism, to name a few. Late in life, Tolstoy even developed anarchistic tendencies, and if you ask me, the philosophy of history of war and peace already show a leaning in that direction. Oh, and by the way, sorry Leo for calling it a historical novel, I know you wouldn't agree. But that's the closest category, okay? War and Peace has been acclaimed for its realistic and long descriptions of battle scenes. Tolstoy himself fought in the Crimean War, and his father had fought in the Napoleonic Wars, so Tolstoy definitely knew what he was talking about. But for Tolstoy, the battles serve a definite purpose, namely that of illustrating his philosophy of history. So what is that philosophy of history? What is power? And what force moves the nations? These are some of the questions Tolstoy discusses in the second epilogue. There he criticises what he considers to be the three most common ways in contemporary historical literature of explaining historical events. One kind of explanation, he says, point to one great man, like Napoleon, as the prime mover of certain historical events. But as other historians point to Tsar Alexander, who's right? asks Tolstoy. Another kind of explanation, like universal histories, point to the interaction of many persons. But what force moves this multitude of people? asks Tolstoy. Yet a third kind of explanation, cultural history, points to intellectual activity as the prime mover of history. But Tolstoy objects that in no case can one admit that intellectual activity controls people's actions. For that view is not confirmed by such facts as the very cruel murders of the French Revolution resulting from the doctrine of the equality of man, or the very cruel wars and executions resulting from the preaching of love. So what is the power of moving history? Tolstoy's own solution is to see history as a continuum of events. Every attempt at selecting a beginning of, say, a war is arbitrary. It cuts the historical process off and consequently damages the understanding of the event. No, historical events consist of a multitude of infinitesimally small decisions, actions and events, which come together to form the historical process. If we, for example, extract a command from Napoleon to go to war against Russia, and say that this is the principal cause of the war, we make a mistake, says Tolstoy. For Napoleon gave a number of commands which were never executed for a number of different reasons. The letter of command was lost, people didn't obey it, the army wasn't ready, etc. etc. The only thing about the command to go to war against Russia which makes it special is that it actually coincided with the course of events that led the French army into Russia. Napoleon's so-called power consisted in him expressing opinions which happened to coincide with a collective action that was performed by all the different people involved. So, if we are to explain history, we have to tell all those small stories, which together form the course of events. But these small stories are again made up of still smaller stories. In that way, history cannot really be explained, just narrated. Or in other words, 
the conception of a cause is inapplicable to the phenomena we are examining. It's been claimed that war and peace has no structure, no organisational principle, as it contains almost 600 characters and a number of plots. This accusation can only come from someone who hasn't bothered reading the epilogue, for as we've just heard, the whole point in Tolstoy's philosophy of history is that historical events consist of a multitude of infinitesimally small units. More valid is the criticism that Tolstoy's view of history is in a sense fatalistic, that individuals have no real influence on the course of history, that people are like ships obeying the waves of the ocean, to borrow one of his metaphors. Tolstoy at length addresses this issue too in the epilogue, as the question of free will versus inevitability, but I'll leave that for you to read for yourself. Let me just disclose that to the question, does man have a free will, or are his actions governed by laws, his answer is something like Winnie the Pooh's, yes please, both. That's all about Tolstoy's War and Peace. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about theories of history, have a look at some of my other videos. See you!